So welcome. Uh, 18 years ago, I started a little open source project, uh, nothing serious. And these days, it's used all across the globe to schedule uh, and uh, plan uh, planning problems. Uh, for example, in some countries, when you go to the pharmacy uh, in the weekend, um, my technology actually decides, decides which pharmacy is open in your neighborhood. Um, or when somebody comes to your door to install cable and things like that, uh, it might actually be uh, our technology which uh, decided which technician actually does that. Or if you appear in front of a judge, even judges uh, are in some countries are planned with this kind of with this technology. So um, um, the world is really full of uh, planning problems, and um, this is a form of and th the project I wrote uh, is actually a solver, and this is a form of AI, but it is not machine learning. So you'll not learn how to write um, a chat box here or a, a chatbot here or anything like that. It's purely focused on planning problems. And the world is really full of these kind of scheduling problems. Let me just give you one example uh, so you can start seeing them too. Uh, so when you walk into an airport, uh, the first thing you see when you walk into the airport is probably an escalator, right? Those things need maintenance. People need to go there um, and actually every six weeks or so make sure that those, um, that those escalators keep working. And, of course, you need to plan which technician goes to which uh, escalator or which elevator at which time, right? Um, you continue your journey and you check in your luggage. Uh, that's a shift scheduling problem to decide who will actually, to decide which person will take your luggage, as well as a desk scheduling problem for the airport to decide which airline gets which desk uh, in, uh, to, to check in luggage. Um, you continue your journey and you see, of course, the, uh, the departure dates. Well, that's a flight sh scheduling problem to decide which flight goes from which location to which location at which time, both for the airline and for the airport. It's actually two different uh, planning problems. You continue your journey, you go through security. Uh, that's, again, a shift scheduling problem. But here you have interesting constraints. For example, you want to make sure that uh, at each of these uh, security checkpoints, there's both a male and a female guard for uh, frisk searches and things like that. Uh, you continue your journey um, and you go to the gate and of course you have a shift scheduling problem and typically these are the same persons who checked in your luggage so uh, when they are actually assigned to these kinds of tasks they need enough time to get from the check-in counter to the gate um, you continue your journey of course and um, th there's a number of you could take any of these planes of course well the plane you <laughs> got decided but um, of course which plane actually does which flight that's an aircraft scheduling problem it actually depends on how many people are taking that flight. And so when we can do it with a smaller plane, uh, we want to do that. The problem is, of course, if you fly a plane to the other side of the world, the next flight for that plane needs to leave from the other side of the world. So it's quite an interesting uh, dilemma there. Um, these planes need maintenance, A and B maintenance, every 48 hours, every eight days, and even more of that. And so um, scheduling that maintenance is also, again, a planning problem. Gate scheduling, you start seeing the pattern here, another planning problem. And of course, uh, assigning uh, people to the flight, uh, being of course the uh, pilots and the stewards, that's a flight crew scheduling problem. So the world is really full of scheduling problems. And this is just one example. You walk into a train station, you'll see hundreds, or you see dozens of these planning problems again. You walk into a hospital, you'll see dozens of these planning problems again. And today, most of these are either scheduled manually or poorly automated, right? So some of them are automated, few of them are optimized. So you can optimize them with Kotlin and AI, and I'll show you uh, how to do that with some, of, uh, with some code later on. Now, you're probably asking, is it worth it, right? Um, why, what happens when we take a, a planning problem that's um, uh, that's solved uh, manually or that's solved um, automatically but with you know not the, the best algorithms and we actually do that with better algorithms right so let me give you just one example this is the vehicle routing problem and in this case we need to assign a number of vehicles to go to a number of locations across the country so for example you can see here we have uh, the depot where our vehicles are leaving from 
and they need to go to these uh, dots. And for example, this purple vehicle has been assigned to go to, to these dots. But of course, we could have assigned those dots to one of the other vehicles and actually changed the order in which they drive. Now, there's a number of what we call constraints there. For example, we want to make sure that if this is a last mile delivery problem, or uh, not a last mile, but if this is a delivery problem or a pickup problem, that there's enough capacity on each of these uh, vehicles to actually pick that, to, to actually do that. Um, we also want to make sure if there are certain skill requirements be, or uh, ability requirements on the vehicle or on the driver of the vehicle that we fulfill this. For example, at this location, we need to make sure that, that that's an expensive delivery, that it's an armored vehicle. And of course, you have time windows, uh, as some of these locations where you have to go to have opening hours. And if you do not appear there, for example, in this case, in the morning, but you appear in the afternoon, then of course, uh, no, there's nobody there to let you in. And, um, and those are all the hard constraints. And then, of course, you also have the soft constraints. And the main one there is, there's tons of those, of, co of course, too, but the main one there is you want to reduce the travel time. And is it really worth reducing the travel time? So we had this case with tens of thousands of vehicles, and they expected to reduce their, driving, their traveling time by 1%. You can imagine reducing the travel time on tens of thousands of vehicles by 1% is a huge deal for that company. And they said that will you know, um, definitely make this project worthwhile. Then they ran the numbers through, year over year, same workload, so actually in production, turns out that they have 25% less driving time. So that's something they told the CEO of this uh, Fortune 500 company, right? So, because this actually reduced their CO2 emissions by 10 million kilograms per year, that's a lot, that's about flying every day 25 uh, people over the Atlantic Ocean and back. Uh, and they also reduced their, uh, they increased their productivity, which means they could do cost saving. They were, their focus was on cost saving to reduce their, um, uh, by hundreds of million dollars a year, which um, uh, was the reason, of course, they, they really liked the project. Now, you're probably wondering, how difficult can it be? It's just, you know, we just need to assign some of these visits to some of these technicians. We write some for loops, problem solved, right? That's how most programmers uh, start at this. And along the way, they learn a few things. And I'm going to try to um, save you some time to get, get through those things. So um, I'm going to take a very simple example to explain it. It's a school time tabling example. You probably remember this from when you went to high school. We're going to assign a number of lessons to a number of rooms. So here you can see we have four lessons. We have uh, two rooms and two uh, time slots. So we have the room A and room B. We have the time slot A at 8.30 and the time slot at 9.30. Uh, and we decide which of these lessons goes into which room. So you can start doing this puzzle already. It's a little bit like Sudoku, but um, you'll see that it gets harder when we increase the number of lessons. And so what you can see here is that math and chemistry, they actually have the same student, the ninth grade. And you can also see that chemistry and French have the same teacher, Marie Curie. Right? And, and again, French and history have the same students. So you might need to make sure that those don't happen at the same time, because as far as we know, uh, neither the students nor even Marie Curie can be at two places at the same time. Right? So um, what do you do? Well, you can give that to a solver like ours, and you'll get a solution like this, right? where it says, OK, you can see um, that uh, this is a feasible schedule. So let's go through those constraints one by one as an exercise. And what you see here is you can see the lessons at the top. And this is a potential solution. This is something which, a combination we could reach. Now, is it a feasible solution? Is it something we can actually execute in reality? Anybody have an idea here? No. Why not? Yes. Uh, definitely, they definitely don't mix, and not at the same time in the same room. right? So um, that's a room conflict. OK, here's another solution. Who thinks this, this is a good solution? Well, there's something wrong with it, because it turns out that chemistry and French are both taught by Marie Curie. And now Marie Curie has to be in two places at the same time. So when we actually take that through another view, right? when we group this not by room but by teacher, you can see that Marie Curie has to be at two places at the same time. Obviously, that's not going to work. So we have a teacher conflict. There's a third form of this, this one. Uh, it looks good for the rooms and for the teachers. Guess where it doesn't look good? For the student groups. We're actually asking the ninth grade, who was doing both math and chemistry, to be at 
to uh, attend two classes at the same time. So you can see by looking at this same solution in three different ways, we can see that um, uh, they might or might not be feasible, right? And this is a student group conflict, of course. Um, the last one here, this is actually a feasible solution I showed earlier, and this is one where we fulfill all of the hard constraints, right? Okay, so this is one that's feasible. Now, um, okay, let's talk about how will this will look in code. Uh, before we get, uh, I'll, uh, let's go through the class diagram first. So we have a time slot, which has a day of week. Uh, you can see here I'm using the java.time uh, library, uh, not the Kotlin one. The reason for that is we need some of the uh, more advanced uh, uh, time functions that are not always available in, in the other one. Uh, but you can choose whichever one uh, fits for your needs, of course, right? And so um, what I have here is I have a day of week, like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday for a time slot. And I have a start and end time uh, in local time. Uh, so I'm not, I don't have a date there because we're, we will be using the school uh, schedule we have for one week and copy it from week to week. And I also have a, a room object that just has a name, like room A or room B. On top of that, I have a lesson class. And the lesson class has uh, a subject like math or chemistry has a teacher like Alan Turing or Marie Curie, and has a student group like 9th grade or 10th grade. Just to keep it simple, I've made that strings for now. Of course, if you have a more production-ready example uh, or case, you will probably make a teacher class and a student group class, uh, but for now, I've kept it simple. Um, on top of that, each lesson will be assigned a time slot and a room. That's when we want to do the lesson and in which room we want to do it. Right. So that's uh, basically a relationship to over there. Um, because when we start out, none of the lessons will be assigned to uh, a time slot or a room. Both the time slot and the room uh, um, fields will be a var, not a val, and they will be nullable because they start out as any other level. Okay, so um, here's how the code. So now we need to calculate the score. So the first thing we need to know is when we have a particular solution. Is it feasible? Is it something we can execute, right? And so let's take a look how this code works. So we get a timetable. We're going to calculate the hard score, and we're just going to start out at zero. And then every time something is wrong, we're going to deduct a point. Why deduct a point? Because then we can always say the higher the score, the better the solution. And that, that's easier to think about it, especially when you start mixing in things you want to happen, rewards instead of penalties. But for now, we'll, we'll, we only have penalties. So what we're going to do is we're going to look for, we're going to go through every lesson. You can write this in different ways, of course. I'm just taking this way for now. Um, you go through all of the lessons, um, uh, every pair of lessons, so every two lessons. And uh, when the room is the same and the time slot is the same, then we are going to lose a heart, uh, then we're going to lose one heart point, right? This, um, and of course, uh, we do the same for the teacher. So when we have a, a case where the two lessons have the same teacher and also they have the same uh, time slot, then we're going to lose uh, another point there. And uh, we do the same again for the third constraint, the student group constraint. In the end, we return that, right? So now we can say, when we have a certain uh, solution, we can now say if whether it's feasible or not with this piece of code. Now, it is actually a very inefficient piece of code, and I'll show you later how you can make this a lot more efficient by using hash techniques and by using incremental score calculation, but that's for later without worrying how those things work. But that's for later. Now, how do we get to those solutions? Because there's a few ways we can assign, we can get to a particular solution where we are assigning these, these lessons to those uh, slots, right? And one way to do that is the greedy algorithm, right? There's basically, when you start out with this problem, you will, re you will look at the two different approaches. You will look, either look at the greedy algorithm or you'll look at the brute force algorithm. And I'll start with the greedy algorithm to show you what happens if you go down that rabbit hole. So um, what you do is you take the lessons, you sort them, and you take uh, one of the, the top of that queue, and that's in this case the math lesson, and you try it out in all of the four spots here, uh, in all of the four slots. So I try it out in room A at 8.30, in room B at 8.30, room A at 9.30, and so on. And I take, and my, I score all of these, and it turns out they all score zero. They're all feasible. They don't break any hard constraints, so I just take the first one. Okay? Very easy. Um, we continue on that, and now we, we take the history lesson, the next, the next one on the queue, and we try to 
uh, put it in each of these particular slots. And what we can see, of course, is with the first one of those, that that is an infeasible solution. So uh, we won't take that one, and we take the next one. And so now we've assigned history here. Little hint, little foresight, we're doomed. This solution is already doomed. If you can see it, um, it's very, very extremely hard to see. I'll get back to that. Now, um, we try chemistry, next one we, on, on the list, and what we do is we, uh, we cannot put it in, uh, any, in room A at A30 or room B or at A30, so we just take the next available slot, and that's that one, so looks good. And then, of course, we have French, and there's only one spot left for French. This is obvious, this place, and we're done. So what's the problem now? Yes? Yes, same teacher in two different rooms. We actually have Marie Curie, again, need to be in, needs to be in two places at the same time. So, like I said, we actually went wrong over here, right? Here, we didn't leave enough room to, for Marie Curie to give both, both lessons. And for this particular simple case, you can see that in advance. Um, and if you can see that for any general case out there, you've solved one of the most, you've solved the most difficult problem in computer science for the last 50 years. It's called P versus NP. Uh, unfortunately, um, yeah, I, uh, many people believe it's not even possible to foresee it. So anyway, so greedy does not give us the f uh, feasible solution, right? Uh, but it does work quite fast, and let me just take you through the code if you want to Im implement this. So what we do is we have an outer loop across the lessons. So we somehow sort the lessons, and you can do this arbitrarily or smarter, but it, and that does give some results quality difference, but not much. And uh, we go through those lessons and we assign them one by one. And the thing to understand here, as soon as we've assigned a lesson, we never move it again, right? So what we then do is we say, okay, we have we have a best score. Just we are just going uh, for each. Of, we're going to try for each of those lessons. We're going to try the time slot and all of the room combinations, right? And then we're going to uh, calculate the score. And so when the score is better than the best score we've seen so far, so that's why we start with uh, the worst possible score possible. Well, the first. The one we see will actually have a better score than this. Then we're going to uh, actually remember that best score, and we're also going to remember the best room and best time slots. That's why we have these best room and best time slot uh, variables. And at the end, we're just going to put it on that lesson. And then that lesson is locked, and we continue to the next lesson. Right? OK. So uh, let's do a demo of that. Now, one of the nice things in Kotlin, I really love this, is Kotlin notebooks. So uh, let's uh, go for that. So this is a Kotlin notebook, and as you can see here, I have the data class of the room as a, as a with the value uh, name, of course, like I've shown earlier. I have the time slot class with the day of week, start time, and end time. And uh, again, the lesson class, very similar to what I was showing earlier. I did add uh, a two-string function here, so just to render it a bit nicer later on. And you can see that while the uh, subject and the teachers are fixed, the uh, Time slot and room classes are not uh, are nullable because uh, those are vars because we of course will change and try different options on that. Ignore the red. Uh, that's that's um, an, an, a small issue in uh, Kotlin notebooks. So um, then of course we have the timetable. What's the timetable? That's basically a way to collect our data set. It has a list of all of the time slots, a list of all of the rooms, a list of all of the lessons, and we'll also keep, once we actually solve a timetable, we'll also put the score on that because it really belongs there, right? Okay, then we have the score calculation I showed earlier where we just basically go through any two lessons and see if they're in the same room, in the same, uh, if, you know, if we have room conflicts or teacher conflicts. One more thing we added here is just so we have a nice score is that if the lesson and the room are the same, we don't actually, uh, we, we ignore it, right? Um, and then, of course, we need to generate some data to try all of this out. So here we have uh, 10 time slots, so uh, over across two days, Monday and Tuesday, and each of them has five hours, three hours in the morning, and two hours in the afternoon. We have uh, three rooms, A, B, and C, and we have 20 lessons to assign do to those three rooms and 10 time slots. So basically, we have 30 slots to put in those uh, tw uh, 20 lessons. However, the 20 lessons are across two different student groups, uh, ninth grade and 10th grade, and about five teachers and um, a number of subjects, right? So 
uh, the greedy algorithm I showed earlier. I'll not go through this again. And then we solve it. So we just load that data set and we solve it. So let's actually run all of this. And you can see that it, sol it started solving the problem and almost immediately it gave us an answer. And that's really nice about the greedy algorithm. It's really, really fast, right? Um, especially when you start, it, it, it differs when you go to like 10,000 of lessons, but for this kind of sizes, it's extremely fast. Um, at 10,000 lessons, you need to do a couple of things on top of it. Uh, now, I've written a visualization. I won't go through the visualization. Basically, we, we bring it into an HTML table, uh, a couple of HTML tables. So let's look at those results. And so what you can see here, I hope that's readable in the back. Uh, what you can see here is we have, across those 10 days, we have um, in room A at 8.30 on Monday math and, um, and then so forth. There's multiple math lessons. And we show this by room, but also by teacher and by student group. And, that, uh, and this way we can easily detect when we have a problem. Now, the rooms are quite fine, as you can see. It means that we don't have two uh, lessons in the same room at the same time. The teachers are quite fine too. But when you look at the student groups, here we have a problem. So here we have both physics and Spanish of the 10th grade at Monday morning at 8.30. So we're asking those students to be in two places at the same time. Obviously, this is not a feasible solution. Um, okay. So that was the greedy algorithm. Um, and so I just compared that greedy algorithm. It's fast, it's scalable, it's far from optimal. In some cases, it's good enough. Okay. Um, let's try something else. What was the other road we could take? Brute force. So um, what happens if we do brute force? We try to assign, uh, we start the same way, we take that math lesson, we try to assign it to each of the slots. But this time, for, we are going to explore each of those four options. So we're going to try the history lesson, not just in this case, uh, in the f uh, when math is in room A at 8.30, but also when math is in room B at uh, 8.30, right? And uh, then we do the same with chemistry. And as you can see here, I've uh, explored two of those, I've zoomed in on two of those branches in the case where history is in um, um, room B and here in a case where uh, history is also in room B, but at 9.30, not at 8.30. And as we continue with that, we start adding in French. You can see, see the number of branches just growing, which is fun. And you can see we run into that greedy solution again, right? Same teacher, and you know, so that's not um, a feasible solution, but we actually do find this feasible solution. So brute force finds us the optimal solution. And you can do brute force in a much smarter way. It's called branch and bound because you pretty much know that if you put history and math here in the same room at the same time, that there's no point looking at all of these options. And that will reduce your um, search pace by about 99%, depending on the use case. So what's wrong with this, right? Why can we not use brute force or that smarter way of brute force? Um, uh, well, before we do, let's take a look at the brute force code. So basically, it loops all the way down, right? So we have a loop where we go uh, for the first lesson, go through all of the time slots and rooms. And nested in that, we have a loop that goes into uh, all of the time slots for uh, and rooms for lesson two and so forth all the way to we hit we hit lesson n of course you'll have to implement this differently because n is dynamic and you cannot write your code like that uh, but this is pretty much what it does right um, what's the problem with that it's called the big o notation um, right uh, which many of you are familiar with uh, uh, so um, so what's the complexity of this well when we have Four, in the four, when we only have to assign that math lesson to those four slots, that's four different options we have. When we now add in all of the options where we also have to add hist history, that becomes four times four different options, or four to the power two. When we na now add in chemistry, it becomes four to the power three. And when we now add in French, it becomes four to the power four. Right? So in generally speaking, when we have n lessons, right, uh, or in this case, when you have 400 lessons, then it's 400 to the power 400. So generally speaking, the search base for n lessons is n to the power n. And a search base for 400 lessons is 10 to the power 1,040. By the way, the average high school has probably more than 400 lessons. We're not even talking about the university yet. We're talking about the average high school, right? So uh, 40 lessons per class, 10 classes, right? Um, so, 
How big is this number? What can we compare it to? How about we compare it, I don't know, to the minimum number of atoms in the universe, right? <laughs> so there's about, uh, according to scientists, uh, in, the minimum, uh, the in the observable universe, 10 to the power 80 atoms. Uh, that's, that's, and that's basically every, every grain of salt, uh, sand has, has uh, millions or billions of atoms. Um, every star has billions of atoms. Uh, every planet has billions of atoms. The whole world has billions of atoms. And of course, it's far, far bigger than that. Uh, in fact, what happens if we use one of those smarter algorithms where we can reduce the search space by 99%? Then for 400 lessons, it does not take 10 to the power 1,040 uh, things we want to look at. It actually only takes 10 to the power 1,038 combinations we need to look at. We can look about with all the computer power on the planet, we can do about 10 to the power 20. So it just takes like, it takes a bit of time. So, yes, um, you can actually visualize this quite nicely. So, um, if you try this with, so what happens if you want to try the 20 lessons case, which I showed earlier, with brute force? Uh, well, I've tried that on a computer, and what you get is, um, with eight milliseconds on that computer, I got, uh, I could do, f uh, I could do, I could do four lessons with brute force. Five lessons took me uh, 0.1 seconds. Six les lessons, two seconds. Seven lessons, about two minutes, three minutes. Eight lessons an hour, nine lessons a day, ten lessons a month, thirteen lessons two thousand years. That's when the Voyager reaches the next nearby star. <laughs> Fifteen lessons two million years. Uh, that's when the Apollo bootprint will fade from the moon. Uh, Seventeen lessons takes five billion years. That's when our sun will explode. And so. Um, that's why I'm not running and waiting for 20 lessons to solve on this machine with brute force, as you can imagine. <laughs> um, so, okay, uh, alg algorithm comparison. Uh, brute force is slow. It does not, not scalable at all, but it is optimal. Right? How can we have our cake and eat it too? Right? So, um, we look at the advanced algorithms. And a set of those is called metaheuristics. And um, in that, you have local search. Uh, another form of metaheuristics, which is not on the list, is, by the way, genetic algorithms. But for these kinds of problems, uh, these algorithms work better. And then you have, inside local, local search, you have things like taboo search, similar leading, late acceptance. And there's like hundreds of more with fancy names. Um, and you could start reading those papers, and you can start implementing them. But just know that using the right algorithm is about 10% of solving this problem efficiency because you need a whole bunch of advanced systems uh, and so forth. So, um, but how do they work? How does this local search thing work? Well, what they do is they take the greedy solution and they evolve on that. So they actually you do use the greedy algorithm, right? Uh, but after that, the, the, the metaheuristic starts. And so what we're going to do is we're going to try to, for example, move that math lesson uh, to the next uh, time slot, right? Or to another room. Um, and so we'll try a number of combinations. And in this case, uh, we, we take the case where we move French into the history room. And this actually breaks the same number of hard constraints. In this case, chemistry and French, the same teacher. In this case, we have, two, we have a room conflict, right? And then um, I'll not go into the details, but there's a way to decide whether or not to accept something. It's not always better, right? And uh, we continue in the next thing where we start swapping things again. And in that case, we actually find the optimal solution, right? And this is how, uh, this is generally speaking, how these, these algorithms work. Now, you could implement that yourself, uh, or you could use our open source library to do that, uh, Timefold, right? So it's a library of optimization algorithms. It has that late acceptance. It has that uh, taboo search and things like that in there. Um, it's AI, that's why we, uh, but it's not machine learning, right? So. Um, um, AI is more than machine learning, and machine learning is more than LLMs these days. Um, it's open source on the Apache license, and it's uh, actively developed, of course, by our open source, uh, open core company. Um, we also provide some platform services on top of it. Um, so it's compatible with Kotlin. Um, you can, we have an example with Kotlin and Quarkus, uh, which fully shows you how to use it. If you're seeing any technologies missing here you want to see in the Kotlin uh, stack, come uh, talk to me uh, after this talk. I'm, I'm very interested in that. 
And of course, we support Maven and Gradle, all, uh, yeah, and, and works on yeah, like everything else on all operating systems and all clouds. So let's say, OK, how can we solve this problem now with Timefold? So what we do is we, are going, we add, of course, the Timefold solver dependency. And then we need to tell uh, Timefold, what do you want to change? right? Because Timefold cannot, for example, say the lessons I'm going to give that another subject or another teacher. right? Um, it's, you know, we don't want to get uh, Alan Turing teaching us French or something like that, right? So um, what we need to do is we need to tell them what it changes. And those are actually the time slot and the rooms. So we need to annotate this and say, okay, that's a planning variable. So the time slot changes during planning and the room changes during planning. So that's a planning variable. And of course, the class that has these kinds of um, and, um, fields, that's a planning entity because that's something that has fields that change during planning. And as said before, we, the, those two fields are annual starting out. Not always. You can do a warm start, too. But most of the time, they're annual. And then um, the solver will fill them in for you. You could write an easy score cal calculator that's very similar to the score calculator shown earlier. The only difference in this, actually, is the fact that at the end, we do hard score off because we want to support not just a hard score, but also soft constraints. We don't just want to have a feasible schedule, we want to have a good schedule, right? And so we'll start adding some more constraints on that later, soft constraints, which we would then calculate with a soft score. However, using this technique, like I said before, is not the most efficient one, right? But before we do that, I want to show a demo of that. So let's switch here. Uh, let me switch to another case. So here's one of our notebooks. You can download these and play with these uh, today if you want to. That's in the Timefold notebook uh, repository. And so what we do here is we import the Timefold solver, as you can see. And um, the remainder is still the same. So we have our data class for room, for time slot. We have our lesson. That's a bit different now. As you can see, the lesson now has a planning entity, which means that it has fields that change during planning. And the time slot and and room uh, variables are actually annotated with those uh, planning variable annotations such that Timefold knows I can change these. We currently also still need an empty constructor. It is what it is. Um, and uh, that's because when we find a new best solution, we need to be able to remember that. And for that, uh, we need the we, we have some internal mechanism that needs a default constructor. Now, um, I've also added a, a planning ID, but this is actually optional. Um, I'll take you through the constraints first. Yes, let's go through the constraints. So here I've added a number of constraints, and as you can see, I already have six. So we have those room conflict, teacher conflict, student group, the ones we talked about. But there's also a bunch of uh, soft constraints, like making sure the teachers are happy by making, basically cramming their, making, giving them compact schedules, uh, making sure they stay in the same room, and of course, make the students grappy, happy that they don't get like uh, four math lessons after each other, but that we, we give them a little bit of variety in their lessons. Um, just for the fun of it, I'm going to all um, disable them. All right. And uh, okay. And then um, what's be I'll just skip these. These are implemented more efficiently, and I'll, I'll go through that later. And then, of course, we have our timetable class. Here we do need an ex a few extra annotations, but you just copy these from the examples, and we're looking to remove all of these. We're basically just saying, OK, here's a time fold where you can find all of our rooms, all of our time slots, and all of our lessons. But you can add a lot more properties to this. And of course, the score is not a, a long anymore, but an actual hard soft score. Uh, that has um, two longs, basically the soft long and the hard long. Uh, we generate the data the same way as shown earlier, and now we solve it. So to solve it, we say, okay, give us a solver factory, as you can. And I'll just run this so it becomes green. Um, and what we do in there, we just say, okay, create a solver. Uh, I wanna. I'm using it. These are my classes. If you use Spring or or Quarkus, these will be automatically detected for you, and you don't have to do this code. But in the Kotlin notebook. Uh, we, we, we still have to do this for now. And then we're saying, I want you to solve for five seconds. Because these meta heuristics solve for as much time as you give them, that's one of their big benefits. It means that if you only have five seconds, it will get you the best solution in five seconds. If you have an hour, it will try to improve the solution uh, uh, up to the point where you need the solution. right? And in this case, um, you, can, you can stop it asynchronously, but in this case, we're just letting it run for five seconds. Uh, we generate the data, 
we create a solver from the solver factory and we call solver.solve. So in this method, we say, okay, here's my problem, um, and it returns back the solution. Okay, so uh, you can see here we solved it. Um, I just ran it, and it uh, finished with zero zero heart. And let's actually take a look at the visualization. Remember, I removed all of the constraints, so I decided to put all of the lessons on Monday morning at 8:30. Not good. Let's go back. Let's go back. Uh, let's turn on this this room conflict constraint. Right uh, here we go. All right, we turn this one on, we run this again, go down. Da -da -dum. And see what happens now. Uh, as you can see, uh, the by room, it looks good. We never have two lessons in the same room at the same time. But if we actually look at it per teacher, we can see two lessons of, of Matt Turing at the same time. And if you look at it per student group, well, that actually ended up well, even though we don't have a constraint for it. That was just lucky. Um, and so let's actually add those constraints too. So I'll go back again. And those were the hard constraints. And OK. Uh, here we go. Now, beyond those two hard constraints, uh, beyond those three hard constraints, there's a number of soft constraints. And I'll just bring you back to the solution first to show you what the problem with this solution is. So uh, in this case, uh, this is a feasible schedule. Um, we don't have uh, any room conflicts, teacher conflicts, or student groups conflicts. But what we do see is if you look at the schedule here of Marie Curie, uh, she does have a gap here on Monday from 10.30 to 11.30. Uh, Alan Turing, that's even a lot more fun. He can show up on Monday, that's good, three lessons in a row, but then on Tuesday morning and then on Tuesday, uh, Tuesday afternoon. Right? That's, that's not really a good schedule for, for Alan Turing. Uh, and again, Darwin and uh, Cruz also, they have many uh, gaps in there. So how can we re remove those gaps? So what we can do is we can actually add this constraint. It's called the teacher time efficiency constraint. All right. And if we now run it, you'll see that it will actually, and, and this is a reward constraint, so we'll actually get a positive score. Right, and this one will actually make sure it will try to push the, the, the lessons more together. We still have a few gaps, like over here, eh, right? But it will actually reduce the gaps, and you can see here 11 soft. And if you would solve her for longer than five seconds, you'll actually see the score improve even further and reduce the gaps even more, right? And this is just one of the many constraints we can add. So um, when we talk about, uh, about these, it's fast. Uh, it's scalable, so it takes the amount of time you have available, basically. Um, so you can get a result very fast. And it's near optimal, right? And typically, in most cases, you have an hour or so to solve during the night, but we also have cases where we do real-time planning, where we have seconds, and then we do warm starts to even get results even faster. Um, so how good are humans at, at this? Well, humans are pretty much like the greedy algorithm, except they're slow. It takes them two hours to, to solve this. Uh, if you go to a hospital, you go to an, um, uh, um, uh, a head nurse right, of a department, and you, ask, and you ask them, you know, how do you do this? Probably they're doing it manually, either in paper or in Excel. They call this automated if they use Excel. Um, and then um, they, uh, and it takes them, uh, an afternoon every week uh, if, you ha if they have 40 nurses. Depends on case to case, of course, right? Uh, but they are scalable because they can handle very big data sets. Uh, well, you can divide, they start, you start dividing the data sets at some point, but they can handle f at least um, you know, hundreds of, sh of shifts or hundreds of lessons. And, but they're far from optimal. And they probably don't realize it um, uh, because um, you know, nobody, no human can take that solution and improve it further. So they believe it's the best solution, but it's, it is, it's simply not. Uh, generative AI, uh, these days everybody's trying generative AI. You can actually ask ChatGPT, give, here's, a, here's my school time tabling problem, solve it for me. And what you will get is a fast solution, um, not very scalable, uh, and far from optimal again. So you'll get the same results as you do with uh, humans in the greedy algorithm. So you really want to use the right uh, algorithm for the right tool for the job, right? Um, and uh, these algorithms can only solve these kinds of problems. They cannot do any of the other things that generative AI can do for you. Um, now, 
let's have some fun in that uh, case again. Well, let's first look at the vehicle routing problem. So this is the vehicle routing problem. Uh, I talked about it earlier where we assign uh, delivery locations to uh, vehicles, right, with all of these constraints. And I just want to do a demo of that. Um, here we go. It's a vehicle routing problem. It's another um, notebook we have. So in this one, we're going to assign, and I have a data set here, a uh, number of vehicles, A, B, C, D, and so forth, to number of locations, to number of visits that we need to visit. And each uh, vehicle has a capacity of 100 items, and each location needs a number of items, like 15, 16 items, and so forth. And uh, when we look at this, what it does, I'll, I, won't, oh, I, can, I won't go through the code right now, but if we print the schedule, um, it's, uh, it's uh, running right now. So here's the, uh, here's the uh, printed solution on where vehicle A goes. It goes to uh, Yuri Bisse, Chiev, I cannot pronounce these names quite well. Um, and so that's the order in which it will go to. But if you look at the visualization, uh, hmm. Ah, here it is. What you can see is um, from the center of, uh, this is actually a map of Belgium, but without the maps behind it. We're, uh, in some of our other examples, we nicely show this on OpenStreetMap, uh, but in the notebook, uh, this is uh, still under development. So what you can see is that this vehicle goes to this location, then this location, and that location, but we could have, of course, assigned another vehicle. And with Candy, we can actually show the number of uh, visits per vehicle as well as the load per vehicle, right? Uh, how, how full they are. And in this case, you can see that vehicle A is, has nine, is picking up 98 items. But the main, main constraint in this, of course, is the travel time. And what we see here, it is doing a traveling uh, time of 240, this is in seconds, if I recall correctly, or milliseconds. And of course, um, as you solve longer, you actually reduce this amount of travel time. Um, let's take a look again at that school time tabling problem, because I had one more thing in there. I really love candy. If, you're, if you haven't played with candy yet, you should, and in, in notebooks, it, this is quite powerful. So when I take the school time tabling uh, result, like the one we had here earlier, this one, right, and I actually run that through uh, Candy, I can actually visualize the number of uh, lessons on each day of the week for each of the stu students, quite, uh, each of the teachers quite easily. And you can see Darwin only has lessons on Monday and all the others have on both days. But I can also show the lessons per hour. So as you can see here, um, nine to, uh, red, yellow, and blue are the morning hours. And uh, sorry, yet red, yellow, and green are the morning hours, and blue and uh, uh, pink are the afternoon hours. Now what we can see is that uh, Penelope Cruz is getting um, to afternoons, but Indiana Jones is getting morning time, uh, morning lessons. So what happens if some of these teachers don't want to work in the morning. Can we add that constraint? Well, what we can do is, uh, and I have a, a slightly different implementation here where we've actually created a teacher class, and I'll just show you here. It's, uh, it's exactly the same beyond that, but I have a teacher class here, as you can see, where the teacher has a name. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to add um, if this, per if this teacher is a mor morning person or not, all right? And so now we can say for each teacher if they're a morning person or not, uh, then of course uh, we need to clean this up. We need to add it there because we call the teacher constru constructor there. And uh, when we go down to the data generation, we now have to say which teachers are morning persons. So let's presume that Alan Turing, academic, uh, that's, that's a morning person. Clearly, Marie Curie, that's a morning person. And Darwin, those are morning persons. But um, Indiana Jones and uh, Penelope Cruz, those are not morning persons. So um, the, if we now run this, when we look at the bottom, we will see that in that nice little diagram we have, all right, which is, will be showing up here, um, that we will ha still be assigning some of these teachers to morning jobs, even they, they are not morning persons, right? 
So where is it right now? Is it solving? Mm, let me do this. OK, this is better. So here we go. It's solving the problem for five seconds. We get a solution. All right. Uh, but we, um, we still have morning uh, lessons for uh, Marie Curie and uh, for uh, Penelope Cruz, for example, in this case. So what we can do is we can add a constraint, but I see that I'm running out of time, so um, I'll publish this on Twitter, but uh, we can easily add a constraint here to do that too, and then we would take that into account. So um, if you want to get started with this, just clone our notebooks repository. Then you can do these examples which I've just shown you. Uh, if you want to see the case where you have a, f a full case with a web UI and so forth, uh, you can take our Kotlin Quarkus example uh, to play with uh, in this repository. And uh, if there's any questions, I'll happily take these after the talk. And you can find our notebooks repository if you scan this QR code. Thank you for listening. <laughs>